Good afternoon. Uh, I am Ladana Shkavari. I'm the director of the Doctor of Nurse Anesthesia Practice Program at Georgetown University. And I'm very happy to be here today with my colleagues, Dr. Mary Harris, Chair of the Department of Advanced Nursing Practice, and Dr. Adelma Yearwood, Chair of the Department of Professional Nursing Practice. Today is Florence Nightingale's birthday and the last day of National Nurses Week 2021. So we're happy to have the opportunity to welcome Dr. Shannon Zenk, Director of the National Institute of Nursing Research at the NIH. The topic of today's webinar, Nursing Research and Health Equity, highlights Dr. Zenk's important body of work in this arena. A fellow of the American Academy of Nursing, Dr. Zenk was previously a professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Nursing. Dr. Zeng's research endeavors have been supported by the NIH. Three years ago, she earned the Friends of National Institute of Nursing Research's President's Award. And her academic focus has been on health and social inequities with a goal of promoting health and eliminating racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic health disparities. Her work, for example, has elucidated the, phenom uh, the phenomenon of built environments and food des uh, deserts. She and colleagues have provided important visibility to lack of access to healthy foods in low income and black communities. Today, Dr. Zenk will share more with us about her work and then we will have the opportunity for conversation and questions. Please join me, Dr. Zadelma Yearwood and Mary Harris in welcoming Dr. Zeng to this special Georgetown Nurses Week lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So nice to be with you and it's certainly an honor to join you today um, and have the opportunity to connect um, on the final day of Nurses um, Week. So, and also, as you mentioned, Florence Nightingale's birthday. Um, I've been the director of uh, the National Institute of Nursing Research uh, for about eight months now. And it's certainly been an interesting time, um, but such, a, such an honor to join this uh, organization, really working around the clock to help the United States and the entire world navigate this pandemic. Um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge my predecessor at NINR, Dr. Patricia Grady, um, who I understand may be joining today. So before I get started, I certainly wanted to take the opportunity uh, to recognize her. As you know, before joining Georgetown uh, as a visiting distinguished professor, Dr. Grady served um, as the director of NINR from 1995 until 2018. And during her tenure, NINR supported researchers made scientific advances that span all corners of nursing science and that have led to improved health outcomes uh, and quality of life for so many. So I know you all join me in uh, thanking Dr. Grady for her work and support of nursing research. So let me get started. Um, in today's presentation, I'll do a few things. First, I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about how I got started in research and became interested in community environments as a social determinant of health. Um, I hope that that will give you a better sense of what shaped uh, my vision uh, for the future of NINR supported science. I'll then talk about the health and healthcare landscape and uh, including the relevance of social determinants of health for COVID-19, today's public health crisis. And then I'll conclude with my thoughts on the vision uh, of NINR moving forward, including our role in training and our new strategic plan that's currently under development. So a little bit about me. Um, first, my background is in nursing and public health. My pre-doctoral training at the University of Michigan was in psychosocial factors and mental health and illness. And my postdoctoral training focused on cancer control and population sciences. Until this past September, um, I pursued research, teaching, and service as a faculty member at the University of Illinois Chicago College of Nursing. Uh, I was there for 
uh, 14 years. And I started that role with a K01 from NINR. So how I became interested in community environments as a social determinant of health, it, it really arose while I was practicing as a nurse. Like many other uh, new nurses, my first job was on a medical surgical unit. But after working in the hospital for a while, I found I wanted more independence and wound up transitioning to a position in home health care. So as you know, um, spending time in patients' homes and in different communities, um, you're really exposed to diverse living conditions. And I was certainly struck by the differences in the environments of the patients in my caseload, both in terms of privilege as well as poverty. Um, certainly, um, some patients um, face challenging living conditions, and I found it difficult to talk with them about healthy eating, for example, when what they really needed to restore their health was far more fundamental. Decent and stable housing, a safe environment, and access to affordable, healthy foods nearby. So these experiences um, raise questions for me about how resources are distributed across communities and the implications of that distribution for people's health. In response, my colleagues and I leverage, leverage new developments in GIS technology and linked these to systematic social observation to generate evidence that revealed injustice in the distribution of food and built environment resources across communities. First in Detroit, later in Chicago, and then nationwide, we found that low income black communities have less access to healthy foods and food sources. For example, in the Detroit area, we showed that supermarkets, which we know tend to have the widest selection of healthy foods, were located over a mile further away from Black high poverty communities uh, compared to white high poverty communities. So this was one of the first studies in the US on what now is commonly referred to as food deserts. This pioneering research helped spur policy changes such as the Healthy Food Financing Initiative to improve healthy food access in underserved communities. We've since generated, generated evidence on how variations in food and built environments affect individual diet and physical activity behaviors and obesity risk. So first, recognizing that existing research was often stymied by the reliance on local cross-sectional studies with relatively small sample sizes, we developed innovative approaches, including leveraging the potential of electronic health records. We launched what at the time of its inception was the largest US study of its kind involving 3.1 million veterans for up to seven years, um, integrating electronic health record data uh, from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs with multiple sources of environmental data. This project resulted in longitudinal data of a critical set of environmental features for the contiguous United States at a 30 meter scale. In other work, we employed a concept of um, activity space, which is from behavioral geography, to enrich the characterization of environmental exposures to include not only the places where people live, but the broader places where people actually spend time and conduct their activities. For this line of research, we were early adopters of mobile GPS sensors. And we've since extended this research with additional real-time data collection approaches to better understand um, for whom the environment matters and actually under what conditions. We've addressed the vexing problem of behavioral weight loss interventions, uh, which tend to have tremendous variability in individual responses and unsustained behavioral and health improvements. Uh, we've done this by evaluating whether community environments alter intervention effectiveness. And we've expanded this work to now evaluate the impact of community investments, such as playground renovations, supermarket openings, and rail to trail developments, as well as policy changes, such as sugar sweetened beverage taxes, WIC retail food package revisions, to understand their impacts on the environment and health behaviors. So I will be continuing this line of research now that I'm at NIH um, through the intramural program at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. 
So I shared that um, just to give you a better sense of um, my background, um, but I also thought it might be helpful to just uh, share a, a couple other, I'd say, key experiences that I see as already influencing my role as NINR director. Um, I've had the pleasure of collaborating with scientists across many different disciplines, and through that I've gained a breadth of experience in and appreciation for different types of scientific approaches. Mentoring future scientists has always been a valued part of my research career. Um, and uh, as I said before, um, before coming to NIH, I was on faculty at UIC for 14 years, uh, working with a number of different students in nursing and other disciplines. I've also had the chance to uh, assume a variety of peer review, uh, service activities and leadership opportunities. And through that, I've learned a lot about promoting scientific excellence. So I think these are some of the other kind of foundational experiences that I brought with uh, to NIH. And I certainly really enjoyed uh, conducting research um, on the issue, the populations that I really care about and colleagues from whom I've learned a lot. And I also enjoyed being a nursing faculty member. But um, when I began having conversations about the NINR director position, learning more and really thinking about NINR scientific possibilities, uh, to advance health and health equity, my excitement about contributing to science in a new way grew. Um, yet I've still taken the experiences as a researcher and as an educator with me here to NINR and NIH. Now I'd like to next turn to the health and healthcare landscape. As we scan the current health and healthcare landscape, it is clear that there is much work to do. More than ever, we see the need for more and better technology, healthcare, knowledge, and public health services to improve our nation's health. We certainly face pressing challenges affecting the public's health and persistent health inequities for which we have an incomplete understanding and insufficient solutions. In the current landscape, racial and social injustices have gained broader recognition, including their wide reaching health effects. Public demand is high for deep and enduring change so that everyone has a chance to live a long and healthy life. Nursing practice and policy solutions in this landscape are urgently needed. For example, although cancer incidence and mortality overall are declining in all population groups in the United States, Certain groups continue to be at increased risk of developing or dying from certain cancers, with Blacks and African Americans having higher death rates than other racial and ethnic groups for many cancer types. Hispanic and African American women have higher rates of cervical cancer than women of other racial and ethnic groups. However, African American women have the highest rates of death from the disease. Deaths from prostate cancer have dropped substantially, fortunately, uh, in recent decades among all men. However, African-American men are twice as likely as white men to die of prostate cancer and continue to have the highest prostate cancer mortality of all US population groups. Also, despite having similar rates of breast cancer, African-American women are more likely than white women to die of the disease. Hypertension-related mortality is yet another outcome for which persistent inequities are observed, as you can see in this graph. COVID-19 is the latest health condition to appear on the landscape for which large inequities have emerged. Dr. I recognize, Zang, yes. Dr. Zang, sorry to interrupt yes. you. Um, since you alluded to a graph, would you mind sharing your screen so we can see the graph you're speaking about? Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I forgot to share my screen. I am That's glad quite you interrupted all right. me. That's quite I'm all like right. going along and like, okay. <laughs> That's well, quite this... all right. <laughs> Listen, we've <laughs> all done something like me. that. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Okay, well, of course. Wow, you missed a lot of really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, I'll go back. So here's the uh, data on cancer disparities. Here's the data on hypertension-related mortality. 
Um, and I think we're caught up. Thank you for stopping me. Can you see everything okay now? Absolutely perfect. And I'm so sorry about the interruption. Oh, no, not at all. I'm so glad you stopped me. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot to share my screen. Um, okay, so let me uh, <laughs> continue this time with slides. Um, all right. So um, as I was saying, um, yeah, I mean, you can pretty much look at any health condition. And unfortunately, we see tremendous disparities um, based on race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. And I was starting to say that COVID-19 is the latest health condition to appear on the landscape for which large inequities have emerged. Um, I do want to uh, recognize um, that many of you may be on the front lines of COVID-19 care. And when all is said and done, there will be many unsung heroes of the pandemic, but it's really the clinicians who put themselves at great risk um, to help others that deserve our special recognition and our gratitude. So especially today on Florence Nightingale's 201st birthday, um, I wanna recognize nurses and nurses on the front line of COVID-19 care. So when we think about COVID-19, we're all too familiar with the statistics. Um, as of Wednesday, April 28th, the CDC reports nearly 32 million total cases in the United States with nearly 570,000 deaths, and that's tragically rising every day. We've also seen sobering systematic differences by race and ethnicity in risks of infection, serious illness, and death. So compared to non-Hispanic white individuals, Latinx individuals are twice as likely to be infected. American Indian or Alaska Native individuals are 3.5 times more likely to be hospitalized and black individuals are 1.9 times more likely to die. Tragically, the emergence of these disparities, I would say was predictable. And social determinants of health are highly relevant for understanding COVID-19 disparities. Washing your hands with soap and water, we know is a critical public health strategy to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. Yet due to water shutoffs or lack of complete plumbing, an estimated two to 15 million Americans have no running water in their home at any given time. The risk is highest in low income and communities of color. In fact, new research estimates that a nationwide moratorium on water shutoffs could have prevented almost a half a million coronavirus infections and saved over 9,000 lives. Working from home has been a key strategy to prevent transmission, yet Black, Latinx, and lower wage workers are more likely to be essential workers and much less likely to be able to work from home. A US study showed that during the pandemic, individuals in high income communities increased their days at home and reduced their days working outside the home significantly more than those in low income communities. Having services nearby to get what you need clearly facilitates staying close to home and can reduce community spread. Yet tens of millions of Americans live in food deserts. Millions also live in pharmacy deserts with a very recently published analysis of the 30 most populous US cities finding 15 million people live in a pharmacy desert. As illustrated by these maps of Chicago, communities of color are more likely to be food deserts and pharmacy deserts. As a result, many low income and people of color had to travel further from home for basic needs like food and medicine. Having few businesses for basic needs may also contribute to crowding at the businesses that are present in low income and communities of color, possibly increasing risk of infection. Moreover, while making COVID-19 testing and now vaccines available at pharmacies is positive overall, those living in pharmacy deserts are at a clear disadvantage. Importantly, COVID-19 will likely have long lasting consequences for the public's health and health inequities, in part because of its powerful effects on social determinants of health. While it may take a, you know, quite a while to quantify the exact impact According to recent data from the Federal, Federal Reserve for the first year of the pandemic, an estimated 200,000 businesses above historic levels permanently closed. 
many businesses continue to struggle and Latinx and black owned businesses have been disproportionately impacted. Millions of jobs have been lost, particularly in the service sector and unemployment climbed during the pandemic. While unemployment has returned to pre-pandemic levels in socially advantaged groups, unemployment re remains disproportionately high among low wage workers, those with less education and persons of color, especially black women and Latinas. Now there are many implications of business closures and unemployment, including lost income and increased financial stress, housing instability, food insecurity, and the widening of the already extreme racial wealth gap. All these have implications for people's health. So this brings us to what we are doing at the National Institute of Nursing Research to advance science and improve health. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about where I see NINR supported science going in the future and how we're planning for that. When I started to think about a vision for NINR, some of the questions I considered were, what are NINR and nursing science's biggest contributions to research and to health? And what are the areas of expertise that NINR brings to the table? To me, I think it's nursing's holistic perspective. That's nursing science's most important contribution to research and health. So what do I mean by a holistic perspective? is the recognition that it's important to address a variety of health needs, certainly physical um, and mental, but also social needs in the context of people's lives and their living conditions and over the whole lifespan. My vision for NINR then is to use nursing's holistic perspective to advance science that improves individual and population health and advances health equity. Collaboratively taking nursing science to these new levels may mean pushing an integrative understanding of health determinants at multiple levels, from the molecular level to the macro level, prioritizing social determinants of health to achieve lasting and upstream change, and ultimately health equity and justice, and discovering nursing practice and policy solutions across clinical settings, as well as community settings, and effective strategies for their implementation. Now, these approaches are applicable across all areas of nursing science, whether they be in longstanding areas of interest, such as pain, prevention, and end-of-life care, or new areas that we have yet to explore. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how we're planning for the future and how you can get involved. But here's a sampling of the questions we've been asking ourselves and others as we think about next steps in our research programs. So first, where can we in nursing science have the biggest impact in solving the most pressing health problems and the most stubborn health disparities? How should we respond to the current health and healthcare landscape? How can we continue to make advances in nursing science and broaden our perspective and reach? How can we, through our science, have a larger impact on nursing practice and policy? And what kinds of training will help nursing scientists propel transformative research? LINR's current five-year strategic plan is set to expire at the end of the calendar year. And developing the next strategic plan is a major focus for us this year. Here are some of the principles that are guiding our process. Think boldly, think differently. Think about the end at the beginning or plan for translation, demonstrate impact, embrace change and opportunity, and mentor the next generation. So we're really excited to see where the planning process takes us. Um, and there's one thing that I am certain of as we move forward. Um, our goal is a bold new agenda for NINR supported science, an agenda that breaks new ground and opens eyes. Um, an agenda that isn't the next obvious thing to do, but an agenda that you know, tackles a seemingly uh, intractable problem, challenge or roadblock, coalesces our efforts around it, and ultimately solves it through our science. So we encourage all of you who are interested in providing feedback for a bold new agenda for NINR supported nursing science to visit our website, or you can send us an email uh, to, a, to the address shown on the screen. 
In addition, um, a working group under the Advisory Council will be presenting their report on future research directions to the NINR Advisory Council uh, on Tuesday, so Tuesday, May 18th. That meeting will be videocast and available to the public. So I encourage you to tune in if you're interested in that group's uh, thoughts on the future of NINR research. More information about that meeting uh, is on our website, so you can find it there. Before I close, I'd like to tell you a couple additional things uh, that are going on at NIH and NINR. Um, recently, NIH Director Dr. Francis Collins announced an important new NIH initiative to end structural racism in biomedical research. Last year reminded us that systemic and structural racism have plagued our society for far too long. Sadly, the research community is not immune from these issues, in fact, far from it. The UNITE initiative was established to identify and address structural racism within the NIH supported and greater scientific community. In his announcement, Dr. Collins said that, and I quote, as a science agency, we know that bringing diverse perspectives, backgrounds and skill sets to complex scientific problems enhances scientific productivity, end quote. I couldn't agree more. A diverse scientific workforce improves the quality of research increases the likelihood that health disparities um, populations participate in and benefit from research and contributes to robust learning environments. At NANR, we fully support this effort. UNITE is comprised of five committees with experts from across the 27 institutes and centers who are passionate about racial diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I'm glad to represent NINR on the N Committee, which is focused on new research on health disparities. And our NINR colleague, Sean Lewis, represents NINR on the I Committee. Under UNITE, NIH will institute new ways to support diversity, equity, and inclusion, dismantle any policies and practices that contribute to structural racism, and support innovative research to eliminate health disparities and advance health equity. You can learn more uh, at the website shown on the screen. Now, as part of UNITE, an NIH Common Fund effort has recently been launched to support transformative health disparities research. Two RFAs were released on March 26 to support research to develop, disseminate, or implement innovative interventions that prevent, reduce, or eliminate health disparities. Um, I'm delighted to say that I've been asked to co-chair this program along with colleagues from the Office uh, on Research on Women's Health, the Tribal Health Research Office, and the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. So we anticipate making about 20 awards through this initiative and applications are due soon on May 28th. In addition, an RFA was recently published on understanding and addressing structural racism and discrimination. NINR is enthusiastically supporting this RFA, so check it out. Applications will be accepted uh, July 20th through August 24th. So I hope that I've been able to convey that it's a really exciting time at NIH and at NINR with so many new opportunities to advance important science and bring about change. And there's a lot of energy and enthusiasm at NINR about the future. So we have a great team in place that's already working hard on moving us forward, but we're also looking for outstanding individuals to fill important positions on that team. So all three of the positions that I'm going to mention um, are key senior leadership roles who report directly to me, help guide the direction of the Institute as a whole, and have influential seats at NIH leadership tables and opportunities to develop collaborations across NIH and beyond. So to start, we've launched a search for the next director of our Division of Extramural Science Programs. Uh, the director guides the direction of all extramural nursing science through new research initiatives and leads the management of research grant and training programs that support the mission of NINR. 
Um, they oversee an extramural grant portfolio that's currently um, about $138 million, a staff of about 25 individuals, the majority of whom are scientific staff. They represent an INR to the extramural scientific community, and they oversee business-related activities, such as the negotiation award and administration of grants. Um, so if this sounds like you or sounds like someone you know, uh, check out the announcement on our website. We'll soon be announcing, very, very soon, uh, our, a search for our next clinical director. The NINR clinical director serves an important leadership role in our division of intramural research. Now the division of intramural research uh, currently has an operating budget of about $11 million with about uh, 25 uh, staff and 20 trainees. The clinical director is responsible <clears throat> for the development and oversight of all research activities involving research participants. So this includes protocol navigation, the supervision of research nurses, and community relationships for participant recruitment and retention. The clinical director serves as the clinical policy advisor and is responsible for the quality of research implementation. They'll also um, play an important role in shaping future directions of the intramural research program at NINR. Um, they will also have resources to direct their own program of research. So again, more information can be found on our website. And then finally, a search will soon be started for our next scientific director, also in the division of intramural research. Uh, so the scientific director leads the division of intramural research, um, which you may know is housed in the world-renowned NIH Clinical Center. Uh, we're developing, as I said, a bold new agenda for NINR-supported science, and this individual will shape future directions of the intramural research and training programs. The scientific director provides overall executive direction, coordination, <clears throat> and scientific leadership for the entire division. And again, they'll have resources to, to direct uh, their own program of research. So um, I hope uh, that you'll think about um, perhaps yourselves or others you know who may be interested in these um, positions. So please um, feel free to reach out to me uh, with any additional questions or information that we don't get to today. Um, I you know, do wanna thank you, uh, Georgetown uh, School of Nursing and Health Sciences. I hope we can meet uh, in person someday soon. Um, but in the meantime, I'm happy to take your questions. Dr. Zeng, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Uh, great work uh, having already been done and continuing to be done. Um, so I guess I will start off with a question and then uh, we'll, we'll see where it leads us. Uh, so we know the National Academy of Medicine report on the future of nursing was released yesterday afternoon, fresh off the press. And the report subtitle, Charting a Path to Achieve Health Equity, really highlights the work of nurses in this space. What are some of your general thoughts about the ways nurses can lead in advancing health equity and promoting diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice? What are some things that us nurses can do? Yeah, um, well, I am certainly looking forward to um, reviewing that report in detail. I was able to listen in uh, to um, part of the webinar yesterday and um, I'm really excited um, about the, uh, recommendations about the importance of nursing uh, to address social uh, determinants of health and advance health equity. So uh, I'm really excited about the report. Um, so, I mean, for us, I think there's an important role for NINR and nursing science as well. Um, clearly, um, research is needed to generate evidence on um, what approaches are effective in addressing social determinants of health and specifically what nursing practice and policy interventions are effective. So um, I think there's obviously a really important connection between uh, research practice and um, education. So uh, I'm looking forward to many future conversations about the implications of that report. Um, and I, I really am so glad to 
um, hear the recognition of the importance that nurses and nursing can play. Our holistic perspective, our reach across community and clinical settings, um, our appreciation and knowledge of um, patients, families, and communities. I think all of this position nursing ideally to respond to social determinants of health and advance health equity. Thank you. Dr. Zank, you're well known for your research and work in the area of determinants of health, as you so eloquently spoke about today. What do you identify as the most challenging issue or issues for nurses working in this area? Hmm. <clears throat> so um, I think I think it's thinking uh, in advance about how to translate our results into um, an impact on nursing practice and policy. I think that requires um, foresight in terms of thinking not only of what are, you know, pressing health uh, research questions, but also then how to take those results, the important and really the essential next step of translating it into practice and policy. I think that requires um, partnerships. I think it requires, um, like I said, kind of advanced planning. And so I really think that, um, one of the biggest challenges we face is really how to take our results a next step to make sure it has an impact on nursing practice and policy so that ultimately um, it improves the public's health and um, advances health equity. So I, I really do think that's the biggest challenge we take is, is that translation piece in terms of practice and policy. On a corollary to that, do you, how do you see, and I'm not even sure how to ask this, but how do you see the role of um, DNP students um, in sort of addressing the whole determinants of health um, issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, it's essential, right? The, um, you know, Future Nursing Report really highlights, right, the um, essential role of practicing nurses. And I would say the partnership between DNP students and DNP prepared nurses and PhD um, prepared nurses, the importance of those connections and close relationships and collaborations has never been um, more important. And um, the promise of that approach has never been more clear. So the thinking of you know them being separate and different tracks, like we really need to get away from that. There are integral partners moving forward in terms of how we make a difference in people's lives and in their health, and you know ultimately eliminate health disparities. So um, you know I I'm super interested in thinking about. Um, what conversations need to happen and what NINR's role is in terms of fostering those partnerships. Um, because really, um, the connections between practice, research, and policy really have never been more clear. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good afternoon again, Dr. Zhang. Thank you again okay. for your presentation. You have made 2021 Nurses Week much more memorable by joining us today. Um, I have a slightly different question. Um, we know that resources are, are very scarce. And so um, what would your recommendations for nurse scientists be if uh, for the hot topics, you know, so it, with the scarce resources, if you had to identify three areas of research that are considered hot topics now in that big umbrella of determinants of health, because there's so many things under that umbrella, what would those three hot topics be? That would be the first question. And then the second question, which may be putting you a little bit more on the spot, is <laughs> um, what are your thoughts about additional resources um, for NINR? Um, do you anticipate that NINR will get more dollars to contribute to nursing research? <clears throat> yeah. Um, thank you for that. those two questions. Boy, both of them are really good questions. And um, 
and uh, thought provoking. So let me start with the second one, resources for NINR. I mean, we um, are grateful for, you know, uh, whatever appropriations we receive, we will always fund the best science and do what we can to um, make sure that uh, the impact of nursing research um, is maximized. So regardless of the resources, um, you know, that's our position is really to support the best science and um, to do what we can to make sure NINR supported research um, makes a positive impact. Um, in terms of three areas of research, oh, that's the one that really puts me <laughs> on the spot. Um, well, I mean, for me, I'll just go back to um, some of the, you know, messages I put out there earlier. To me, I really think um, that uh, nursing is really well positioned to impact social determinants of health. So really, um, our understanding of patients families, communities, our perspective that really recognizes the importance of addressing health needs within the context of people's lives, their families, and their communities. I really think that positions as well to address social determinants of health. If we really are serious about um, addressing health disparities, and I certainly am, and NINR certainly is, we know that that cannot happen without addressing social determinants of health. So we really need evidence um, to inform um, practices and policies that will make a difference in terms of eliminating health inequities. So one area, again, is, is really social determinants of health. Another area is uh, translation. Um, not only do we need to, um, I'd say, focus our research uh, directly on um, identifying nursing practice and policy solutions, but there's this big gap, as you know, between identifying what's effective and actually getting it implemented into practice and policy. So that implementation science piece in terms of how do we um, even take things that we know are effective and um, do the science uh, to identify what works to get them implemented, I think is critical moving forward because our science is for naught, right? If we can't get it into practice and policy um, to really make a difference in people's lives and their health. So I, I do think those two things are important. And I think um, uh, COVID-19 has shown, um, you know, the importance of integration um, between clinical and acute care types of um, approaches, uh, models of care, uh, service delivery, and community, right? We often right, treat these separately, but the greatest biomedical or um, you know, advances in acute care, if we cannot get them into the community or we can't sustain them when people leave the hospital to go home, um, it's not going to be effective. We really need to bridge um, kind of acute care uh, approaches with community approaches um, to have a more holistic approach to uh, improving health. And so I think that integration is really um, consistent with our strengths in nursing in terms of, again, our holistic approach and um, our practice, which really spans such a wide variety of not only clinical settings, but community settings, schools, workplaces, um, criminal justice settings, the community at large. Nurses are all in all of those spaces in addition to hospitals and clinics. And so I think drawing on our broad reach to come up with integrative solutions, I think um, there's a lot of promise in that idea. I, I wanna thank you for your answer. I think you have kept the bucket wide open. You have not excluded any scientists out there because I think your response is really just affirming that we are nurses are, in, a, in an incredible position to contribute to health and 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 we don't need to limit our ourselves we we have a lot of um, areas that we can actually move our research forward in so thank you very very much for that i'm going to oh. take the liberty and just ask you we have a, a honors nursing program for undergraduate students who spend three semesters with us who are excited about doing some research and, and learning from the faculty how to you know, set up a research project and actually implement it, go through IRB and, and, and all that. If you had one 
um, one piece of advice for that group. They're like 20 and 21 year olds who are very excited about, you know, joining the profession, but also getting involved with nursing research. If you could give them one piece of advice, what would that be? Oh, man, you're good at the <laughs> the challenging questions. That I, um, wow, what? And it, I have to boil it down to one. Um, I, I would say it's kind of a two parter, but you know, think big and make an impact, right? Like, um, you know, the the need is huge. Your possibilities and your promise are just as large, and. Um, uh, we need you. Um, the, you know, the pandemic has shown uh, we need the best and the brightest um, applying their talents to solving um, the, you know, most terrible um, challenges that we face. And um, who's better to do that than nurses? Um, so think big and uh, think impact. And wow, I am so excited to see what our next generation um, of nurses uh, do uh, to improve the health of the public and uh, I would say eliminate health disparities. Great, thank you so much. Dr. Harris, I think you, yeah. You have a question. We have a question actually from uh, one of our participants, Dr. Deborah Dole, who is a faculty um, at the School of Nursing and Health Studies asks, can you address how efforts going forward will move to actually impact re the relationship of nursing to the social determinants of health? Oh, sorry, could you repeat that again? Yeah, can you, uh, the question asks, can you address how efforts going forward will move to actually impact the relationship of nursing to social determinants of health? Mm, mm -hmm. um, well, for research, right, I think there, we have a, you know, a pretty good sense of what the kind of um, influential social determinants of health are. Um, we know housing matters, we know transportation matters, it spans a wide variety of sectors. Um, but what we don't know uh, as much as what, what's effective in addressing those factors. Um, how can we integrate um, you know, healthcare with addressing social determinants of health? How do we bridge, again, people's lives and living conditions um, with what happens when they come in uh, to the hospital and clinic and when they leave again? So, um, so for me, I think, um, I think there's so many unknown questions about what's effective, what works uh, to address social determinants of health. And, um, drawing on nursing's holistic perspective, um, you know, what's nursing's role in that and what's the, you know, creative uh, solutions that nurses can come up with in that space. I think there's tremendous opportunity there. Um, so I'd say um, possibilities are endless. And just to dovetail on that, what do you see as major barriers for nursing to be engaged in this arena? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a good question. I think for um, nurses in uh, clinical settings in particular, um, you know, we're so busy, right? Like with the acute needs of patients and often overwhelmed with those needs. And especially in the time of COVID when we're not only providing the direct care, but serving as the main uh, support person for individuals. Um, you know, the, the time and the bandwidth to, um, um, some might say, to kind of deal with the broader social needs and social context of um, patients might be challenging, but we're already doing that. We're already, when people come in, planning for what happens when people go home. Um, so it's not that um, different in some respect. I think the future nursing report highlights the importance of reimbursement and how um, the pay for service model makes it, you know, challenging nurses not being able to um, practice to the full scope of their practice. So we do face challenges um, for sure, um, but they're not insurmountable. And by, you know, drawing the attention, for example, of um, 
of policymakers to our promise, the impact of our research, the difference we can make, um, I think that'll go a long way. And I think we just need to keep getting, uh, producing the evidence that we need to show the impact of nursing and, um, you know, working with others, advocating and disseminating the impact that we can have. Um, and hopefully the rest of it will fall into place. Thank you. A very hopeful message, I think. Uh, so yeah, definitely. Uh, we do have a comment uh, from Dr. Pat Grady. Uh, oh. Dear Shannon, uh, thank you for sharing your innovative research and your vision. Uh, I appreciate your kind comments. Best wishes for continued success as you move forward in your position as director of NINR. So oh, thank Pat you, Dr. Grady. So nice. That was so nice of you. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions for Dr. Zank? Any final comments uh, from you, uh, Dr. Zank? It's really been such an honor and a pleasure to meet you and to have the opportunity to converse with you and uh, to get to know a little bit more about your research and really the future direction of uh, NINR. Uh, so we thank you very much for sharing uh, some of your thoughts with us. We know how busy you are, especially in this time uh, and cannot thank you enough for joining us. Oh, such a pleasure. Yeah, look forward to the next time, hopefully in person. And yeah, thank you so much for inviting us. Wonderful, thank you.